Hello, today we'll look at the symptoms of heart failure and it's very important to know that the symptoms are very important for the diagnosis. Of course, you can do laboratory tests, you can do ECG, you can do echocardiogram, but these are only complement, complementing the symptoms. The symptoms are the most important for diagnosing heart failure, and therefore this video is very important. So, dyspnea is a typical uh, symptom of heart failure patients. It has a very high sensitivity and high specificity. Sensitivity and specificity mean uh, two different things. When we have a high sensitivity, that means that many patients with heart failure will have dyspnea. And uh, the specificity means that when you see dyspnea, uh, it's, it's indicating heart failure. So it's almost the same thing, but, but not really. Because, for example, if you take another thing, we have, for example, S3 gallop rhythms. These are uh, when, when we are auscultating the heart, and then we hear an extra heartbeat, an extra heart sound. Not heartbeat, heart sound. Because usually we have two sounds, when S1 and S2. But when we have, hear an S3 sound, then it, this is called gallop rhythm because it sounds like a horse is galloping because it's three sounds here and this has a very high specificity this means that when uh, the sensitivity is low for example in this s3 gallop that means that not all the patients or not many patients has s3 gallop rhythm in heart failure so many patients with heart failure does not have S3 gallop rhythm, not many patients, but whenever you hear an S3 gallop rhythm, it's pretty specific for heart failure. So whenever you hear it, then you can be more sure if the specificity is high that this is heart failure. So you see, this is the difference between sensitivity and, and, and specificity. And usually we can, we can say actually in general terms that dyspnea does have a high sensitivity and all other symptoms that I will mention have high specificity. But dyspnea actually has high sensitivity and high specificity. But that's the only symptom that has both of these. The other symptoms that I will mention all have high specificity, which means that not many patients have these symptoms, but whenever you have these symptoms, then you can be sure that this is heart failure. So S3 gallop rhythm, that, that was another one. We said that it's sounding like a, a horse galloping. And this is usually when the atrial pressure is more than 20 millimeter, millimeter mercury. So 20, 20 millimeter mercury is the atrial pressure, more than that. Or that the ventricular and diastolic pressure this means that we have a heart that is pumping that is systole and when it's relaxing it's diastolic and when it's relaxing that's the diastole in this uh, diastole we can measure the pressure in the ventricle because we have four chambers we have uh, two atrial chambers and two ventricles and in the ventricle in the left ventricle we can measure the pressure in the diastole, so in the, in the relaxing phase. And if it's more than 15 millimeter mercury, that can also be seen in gallop rhythm. So two things here. We have a high left atrial pressure of more than 20 millimeter mercury and a high end diastolic left ventricular pressure that is more than 15 millimeter mercury. That was S3 gallop rhythm. What, what we can also do when we check the patient is that we will, for example, um, try to feel, to palpate the apical beat, the apical impulse. And the apical impulse will be tend to, tend to move uh, to the more lateral side, so the more to the left. And this can indicate then uh, that we have left ventricular displacement or left ventricular hypertrophy, enlargement to the left side. And this is typically seen. So this, uh, this is a displaced apical impulse, and this have very high sensitivity and specificity. Okay, and uh, what about narrow pulse pressure? This is when we uh, measure the pulse, and we have a difference between the systole and diastole. As we said, the systole when the heart contracts and diastole when the heart uh, is uh, relaxed. And we know that when we measure the blood pressure, we usually say that, uh, yeah, the blood pressure is 120 to 180. 
So 120 systolic and 80 diastolic. Okay, the, this means that the pulse pressure is the difference between these. 120 minus 80, that is 40. So the normal pulse pressure is usually 40 millimeter mercury. But in narrow pulse pressure, when we talk about narrow one, for example in heart failure, then this pulse pressure is less than 25. So the normal is 40 and in heart failure is less than 25. That would, for example, mean that we have a systolic of the 120 systolic and 100 diastolic. That's a very narrow pulse pressure. Mm -hmm. what, what, what can we also check with the pulse? Uh, it's, we have something called pulsus alternans. Pulsus alternans. This means that it's, as you hear in the name, the pulse is alternating between a strong and a weak pulse. And it's, and it's spaced evenly. So you have a strong pulse, and then you have a weak pulse, and then let's say we have one more weak pulse, then you have a strong pulse, then you have a weak pulse, and a weak pulse, then a strong pulse. It's very alternating. Okay, and this is something that you can feel uh, in the radial artery here. Or what we can do is that we measure the blood pressure. So we pump it up. We pump up this cuff. Then we auscultate here the arteries and when we hear and then we start to reduce the pressure so when we have when we have pumped up the cough we don't hear anything because that's constricting the arteries but then we start to release this cough and when we hear the first sounds these are the strong sounds very very strong sounds okay strong pulsation and then we then we listen how it sounds let's say it sounds like this bang bang Bam. Okay, and then we uh, reduce the sound a little bit more, and then we start to hear a, hear a weak sound also. It says bam, 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 bam. Uh huh. So then these weak sounds and the strong sounds are alternating, and this is called pulsus uh, pulsus alternans, and this is very typical, uh, typically seen in heart failure patients. Good. Uh, what about another test? when we're talking about pulses and so on, we can test something called the jugular venous pressure. So we will, uh, we will take uh, the patient, we will uh, make him sit in a 45 degree angle. So not straight, 45 degree angle. And then we have something called internal jugular vein, not artery, vein. And uh, the pressure usually should, or, uh, should not be so high that the vein is pulsating because then, then the pressure is too high. And in heart failure, we have a so high pressure that the vein is pulsating. And this means that, for example, you have this vein, internal jugular vein is going to the right atrium eventually. Okay? And this means, so through the bigger veins. But I will not deal with anatomy here. The importance is that the internal jugular vein is then connected indirectly by some uh, bigger veins to the right atrium. So, if, if we have heart failure, the pressure will build up in the heart and therefore, the right ventricle pressure is so high that the blood cannot flow into the right ventricle, uh, right atrium, which means that the blood pressure will go up instead into the internal jugular vein. So, what we can do is we measure how far the pressure goes up. If it's more than three centimeters from the right atrium, then it's a typical sign of heart failure because the normal should be maximally one to three centimeters. But if it's more than three centimeters if the in, in the internal jugular vein, then we know that this, this can be a sign of uh, heart failure. Good. Uh, we have something called hepatojugular reflex or reflux. This is when we want to check this internal jugular vein. Where we will do that by compressing the right upper quadrant because we can divide the abdomen into, f into nine quadrants. We divide it first like this and then like this. And in the right upper quadrant where we have the liver, and if you compress the liver where we have the inferior vena cava, this is a vein that is going to the right atrium. If you compress that and you see that the internal jugular vein is going, uh, more, is going higher than three centimeters above the atrium, then we know that this is a 
positive hepatojugular reflux, which means that in the, the jugular venous pressure is high, which is usually seen in uh, heart, failure patient, uh, heart failure patients. Good. So we had the patient, we said we will uh, let just make a quick summary. Dyspnea, so difficulty breathing. We had this internal jugular vein is uh, higher than usually. The pulsus alternance, that the pulse is alternating in, uh, in, in strongness when we release the cuff and we start to hear the weak sounds also. Then we had the pulse pressure that was less than 25. Usually it's between, uh, so it's usually around 40 because 120 minus 80 is around 40, but here it's less than 25. These are very typical signs of heart failure, but we, we have many more. So let's deal with them one more. The patient is also sweating a lot. He's sweating. He has edema in his legs. Then we call it peripheral edema. He has edema in his legs. And he has also ascites, a lot of fluid in his abdomen or even a lot of fluid in the scrotal region of a male patient, but a lot of ascites, a lot of edema in his leg. So it's a lot of fluid, it's a fluid overload. Good. Uh, what can we also see? For example, when he's lying down flat, we said that he had dyspnea by only small exercise or only by, for example, walking a little bit, then he has difficulty breathing. But he can also get difficulty breathing by only lying down in his bed. And therefore, he prefers to sit in the bed instead when he's sleeping. He cannot really lie down because then he cannot breathe so good. And why is that? Because it's a lot of fluid overload. It's a lot in heart failure. It's a lot of water here. And, and the water can go into the lungs. And when you have a lot of water in the lungs, this is called pulmonary congestion. And then you get difficulty of breathing. And also, not, not only that, when the heart is not pump, pump, pumping good, then the water, water content, the pressure will build up into the liver. So the liver can get larger also. So then we call hepatomegaly. The, the, heart, will can, uh, the heart will also become larger. And we call it cardiomegaly. The spleen can get larger because the, the blood from the spleen goes also uh, to the heart. And if the pressure is high in the heart, then the blood cannot go into the heart. So that's the whole thing that you need to remember. The pressure is so high in the heart that the blood cannot go into the heart, which means that the pressure will build, build up peripherally. It will build up in the internal jugular vein. It will build up into the liver. It will build up into the spleen. It will build up into the, to the veins of the, uh, of the stomach, which will cause ascites. It will build up into the veins of the legs, which will then cause a lot of edema in the legs, a lot of uh, leg swelling. He's sweating a lot, as we said. He has difficulty breathing. So these are typical signs. When we have chronic, chronic type of heart failure, you can get a very interesting uh, symptoms like anorexia, actually anorexia. So we will have a reduction of weight when you have this heart failure for a very long time. So it's typically seen that his arms are very thin and, and legs are very thin, but, they, but there's still leg, leg edema or there's still ascites, a lot of water in his stomach, but, but, but generally the weight uh, reduced in this in this patient and the patient is feeling very weak uh, fatigue he cannot really move so much because he he gets uh, difficulty breathing by by just moving a little bit and this is a very severe type of uh, heart failure good so let's recap now we get the patient he's sweating a lot he is uh, having leg edema I see that he has a lot of water in his stomach I see that uh, he is uh, having difficulty breathing, so dyspnea, and I check his jugular venous pressure by pressing the liver in the right upper quadrant, and I will see that it's increasing more than three centimeter. And I'm doing this when the patient is sitting in the 45 degrees, and this is called the hepatojugular reflux. And then I check his pulse. I see that the pulse pressure is lower than 25. I also see that the pulsus alternance, when I compress with the blood pressure cuff, I compress the arteries and then ascultate, and I hear a strong sound and I hear a very weak sound, and it's alternating. I always I also ascultate the heart, and I hear the S3 gallop rhythm, so it's like a horse galloping. And um, 
I also see that he is very fatigued, very uh, very weak. He cannot really lay down because this is called orthopne, and he has difficulty breathing when he is laying down. Uh, I, 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 I palpate the liver, I see it's very enlarged, the spleen is enlarged, also the heart is enlarged, and uh, this this can this can cause that the apical pulse is also uh, directed to the left, so it's lateral to the mid-clavicular line, mid-clavicular line it's epic it's lateral to that uh, and 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 uh, um, that's it also what I see in the legs except for this leg swelling is that there is a peripheral vasoconstriction which will cause a very cool foot so the the foot is very cool and it's very pale uh, compared to normally and um, also it can also be that uh, not only pay but it can be actually blue also so it's it's depending on which which stage but it can be pale cool and cyanotic we call it it's blue then cyanotic good so i think that is enough of symptoms so if you have any of these symptoms then that's indicating um heart failure and as we said uh, almost all symptoms are usually specific which means that uh, the patient does not have these symptoms very commonly, but if they have, it's very specific for heart failure. Uh, the only symptom that is really sensitive is dyspnea. That means that the, uh, many patients have dyspnea and also this displaced apical impulse that is also very sensitive. So these two are very sensitive and the displaced apical impulse is sensitive and specific, both of them. Okay, good. I thank you very much for listening.